smell it. I smell the tendons of turkey. I feel it in my bones. That's not good. I have today, Friday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I'm there. You got a couple more school days, suckers. Yeah, true, true. Because uh, some of us will be sharing the glory of the boat trip. So that's pretty sweet. Stop talking about it. Some of us will not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right around the corner, right around the corner. It's like they put me in a stupid waiting list. I don't know about you. Um, for me, this is definitely the hardest part of the year. I feel like I've got like every kind of crunch time all at once. But I'm pretty fired up because if I can just make it a few more days, if I can get to Thanksgiving. I always do. I like I've done it like for every weekend, and then Monday comes around, it's like, oh, it's still sucks. Yeah. Oh, dude, I want to be, I want to be fishing and diving. Like I don't, I don't even think I'll be present at it Thanksgiving dinner, but. <laughs> Thanksgiving with our dinner. Right, we're going to the north coast, the rest of the family. Uh, Mando, Trinity River, so abalone, Chinook salmon, black trumpet mushrooms. Damn, you're gonna. Okay, that was a fun talk. Not me. Let's make sure that we're all on the same page. Has everybody completed the Unit 4 makeup? Anybody still need to do this? Does anybody still need the Unit 4 makeup? Um, does anybody still need to sign up for the Endangered Species? Uh, Marlon, will you keep that paper moving? If, if you're not actively reading or writing on it, keep the paper moving. Thank you. Um, it might work better if you just take four quick photographs of the paper so that then you can peruse the list while everybody else is moving it around, maybe. I don't care your call. Um, did anybody see the movie last night? And uh, feedback? Yeah, pretty sweet, right? Uh, it plays again tonight. So if anybody... Uh, what? Hour and a half, hour and a half, hour and a half, hour and a half. All year long, don't ask me anymore. Hour and a half. Um, and are there any questions or confusion about the next um, seven days of school? Sweet. Let's crush some more goals. I want to go back to yesterday's genetics, diversity, and risk. It's a bunch of vocab. Did we give you three stars? Yesterday, for diversity, bottleneck, and risk? Yeah. Okay. So, genetic diversity, bottleneck, and risk. Where's my phone? So this is the part where I hope we're all uh, getting organized. Your, um, your, uh, blah, 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 blah. Your, your study guide didn't really make this into a study goal. I think later on there will be a study goal that kind of talks about this. This is just like vocabulary terms that combine, triangulate around a critical concept in conservation. So however you organize your notes, remember this is three stars, critical content. And now, I want you to use your imagination, use your imagination, what sort of events could put a species, or even just a population, into genetic risk? What could do this to them? Yeah. That's actually kind of interesting. I hadn't even thought of that, but you're totally right. And that's like the dogs that have like crappy heart quality and stuff. 
Dude, that wasn't on my list, and that's brilliant. Thanks for mentioning it. All, all these years I haven't thought of that. See, kids, he's not stupid. I told you. I'm a kid. I know that. Okay. <laughs> yes, Paul? Okay. Yes. And can we classify that as part of a bigger group, which we might call natural disasters. Um, any other ways to reach a small population, like natural disasters or mass disease? I mean, I get a few people on YouTube, so I yeah, and when we talk about mass disease, I, I, in my notes, I have like a other way of saying it. Are all species destined to survive forever? No. Are they always destined to be the winner in the evolutionary scheme of things? Instead, sometimes they are the... And that's what my notes say. Like, sometimes species just lose. <laughs> you know, it's almost impossible for any event to kill off every member of a species. But if there's a disease, or if there's a new competitor, or like if climate changes and that form of making a living doesn't make sense, like California condors, they're just like leftovers. Ever since the Pleistocene, they've been the losers. Once you get to a really low population, it's usually the genetic risk that wipes out the last couple. You know what I mean by that? Once you're kind of inbred, once you're kind of low in diversity, that's like an old man standing at the top of the stairs blindfolded with a broken cane, like, okay, something's gonna go wrong here. In the dark. Very tired. All right. <laughs> So we've got our natural disasters, we've got our losers, we've got selective breeding. Anything else that can make a small population? Well, anything really when the death rates are high. Yeah, so plain old dying. I guess I would just call that losing in general. <laughs> you do. Less what? Less species being produced. Less individuals or less species? Less individuals, yeah. So something is making them lose, right? Like maybe they're running out of food. Yeah. Or this, yeah. So I'm still going to call that losing. Okay. You, you have to find population decline. So what else would cause these small populations? There's a couple other things left. Uh, human destruction of a habitat. Yeah. Us. Human pressures. Like maybe our hunting. Maybe our polluting. And by the way, maybe that's just losing. Like, maybe we're just like a really high impact species. Maybe we're like a disease, so to speak. Not even on purpose, we just sort of like, goodbye, frogs. It's not your fault, it's not my fault. You know, frogs gotta lose. Last thing. Usually humans do it, but it can happen in nature too. So this is a separate, yeah, more. Oh, darn. Um, I'll leave that in the general human pressures. That doesn't happen in nature. There's something that happens in nature that humans do it, but it can also be caused by, like, mudslides and tectonics and, like, continental uplift and climate change. This one's usually the one that students don't guess, so I'm just going to give you 10 seconds more. Habitat. Habitat. Like, Habitat. 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 You're right there. Here we go. Oh, stop. Isolation or habitat fragmentation. Sometimes you split off a small group. I'm such a jerk. I did not tell you about this. But you guys all know Kyle Skinner, student at high school? He's a nice kid, senior. His dad runs like... Uh, programs for the public at the Natural History Museum. And last night, they had a big presentation about predators in the urban landscape, like mountain lions and stuff. 
Apparently, the Santa Monica Hills, like in the middle of Los Angeles, they have five mountain lions. They all wear like a GPS earring. They've all been monitored for like a decade now. Every time they make babies, the babies can't escape because they're stuck by freeways. There's no way for them to leave those foothills. And sooner or later, they start competing with the parents, and the parents will kill them. Happens every year. Those five mountain lions make on average four or five cubs per year. And when they go back into the breeding season, they're like, okay, you're still around. You couldn't get out of the house, and I mean the house, and so they kill them. Does the babies never end up killing the parents? Sooner or later, the babies will probably be healthier than a parent, and there will be a little generation shift, yeah. And they can't push them out because they've got freeways everywhere. We have fragmented their habitat. So that little cluster, they're just inbreeding and inbreeding. And in no genetic diversity, no outbreeding, no new genes, no, like they're just stuck. Because we have isolated them. We've fragmented their, that's so weird. Sorry. When people sneeze and don't make noise. It's like, where did it go? Is <laughs> that part of the outlander? Like when people aren't looking, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> Art blow out. <laughs> you see, like you couldn't even tell it. You're like three feet away. I didn't know she so that's what I'm saying. I didn't want to interrupt you. That's not natural. That's not natural. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> She's trained herself to not. This is what I do to people. I mess with their minds until they're like sneeze suicidal. <laughs> And when are you going to take a makeup test? Are you talking about this? You are taking Remember that habitat fragmentation is a human thing, so maybe you could think of it as a human impact, but you could also think of it as natural, like on the big island where lava flow just divided habitats. That can happen in nature too. Were we affected by these lava flows? Is that what you know? Yes? Okay. You're making a sad face at the level. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to talk more about genetic risk, isolation? I wanted you to have these little notes on our warm up before I move on. Anyone? Cool. <laughs> Yesterday we talked about 23, 24. I told you that one for 25, right? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. 26, five kingdoms as opposed to domains. Please look up over here. I find this to be one of the most fascinating single papers on the planet. If you're ever going to be a scientist, you should get this and put it on your wall. It's a single poster with the history of life on Earth that correlates evolutionary trends, uh, meteor strikes, uh, tectonics, has the names of the eras and periods in millions of years, and defines all the organization of life on Earth in its major groups. I love this poster. But check this out. When you were in like middle school and when I was your age, they taught five kingdoms. Um, prokaryotes, uh, protists, plants, fungi, and animals, like that. Mm -hmm. Funny thing is, now that we've gotten better at genetics and stuff, when we look at the life on the planet, we realize these all came out pretty quickly and they have a lot in common. But those bacteria, they're either the true bacteria or the weird, unusual ones. Those divided a long, long time ago. And then spawned off what became the others. So instead of five kingdoms, we now talk about the three domains. The true bacteria, the unusual bacteria, and everything with a nucleus. I gotta tell you, this is just like scientific trends. We're just organizing it differently. Now that we pay more attention to genetics and science, we just see that genetically speaking, this is probably a more accurate way to define stuff. If it's your job to organize the shoes at Nordstrom's, you kind of get a lot of leeway, and somebody else might come in and work with you and be like, you know, we should put the rain boots in the seasonal area. 
and like people argue about how to classify stuff, this is the way it stands now. We've broken up those five kingdoms differently into one domain and split this one into two separate domains because of evolutionary genetics. Um, can you? I don't need to put them. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so we've named about one and a half million. And depending on which scientist you ask, there may be as many as 100 million more. Uh, recently, people have even suggested a higher number because it's really difficult to define what different species of bacteria are. Like, those are kind of hard to distinguish. Like, you can say, like, lion is different from dog. But it's kind of tricky to make the distinction between species of microbes. So is that why there's the Correct. Correct. There's all the ones we know, that's the minimum, 1.5 million that we've given names to. Then, obviously, we keep finding new ones every year, so there's a lot we don't know. So it's got to be more than 1.5 million. And then people kind of extrapolate, like, if we're finding this many, and we haven't been to this, this whole street, and we don't have too much access. So people are guessing somewhere in the 100 to 150 million species on Earth, depending on how you define species of microbes. Uh, sharks, number 27. Sharks can live anywhere in the ocean. Their fundamental niche is ocean. Technically, most sharks can swim way down to the deep, dark cold. Technically, they can survive in the cold Arctic. Technically, sharks can pretty much go anywhere you want on the whole entire map. They're Fundamental niche is ocean. Their realized niche is, yeah, I could live there, but I don't want to. Their realized niche is the coast in temperate regions of the world. Fundamental is everything you could make a living. Fundamental is how you sort of actually prefer to make a living. Realize. What he said. Realize is how you prefer. What? Well, I think that the, the main way is um, we know a species can live in many different habitats, but we want to preserve its optimum conditions. So like a lot of times when you find a species that's just barely scraping by, it's because it's in its fundamental niche, not in its realized historic niche, historically realized niche. Uh, number 38, how predators increase biodiversity. Have we talked this to death already? Anybody want to ask me about the predator effect? They limit competitive exclusion. You keep one species from getting rid of the others that it competes with. Predators limit competitive exclusion. Is the best way to say it, I think? All right. If nobody wants to ask me about that, is there anything else in 5.2 you'd like to ask me about? <coughs> Anything else in 5.2? Last call. Okay. If there are no other questions, vocab on 5.3. I think it's hopefully kind of straightforward. There was that big old table with a bunch of vocab. Anybody want to ask me about vocab in 5.3? Yeah? Okay, functional extinction is if you have a few left, but they can't breathe. Like the black rhino is fundamentally extinct. We have three of them. Why would that be extinction? Yeah, they're all boys or they're all girls or they're all too old or whatever. I think the black rhino, because there's one species and the white rhino that's down to one. There's one There you go. White rhino. Okay. I must be mistaken. Let's say the white rhino is functionally extinct. You got one left, but that doesn't mean you're going to get any more, so functionally speaking, it's extinct. Uh, punctuated extinction is mass extinction. It's when a lot of stuff goes extinct at once. 
If you look up here, there have been one, two, three, four, and now we are the... Wait, one, two, three, four, five. Now we are the sixth. Punctuated extinction, also known as mass extinction event. speciation. And so we will talk about this tomorrow, but in the history of life on Earth, you get like very gradual extinction, or occasionally one will lose and be replaced by another species, but most of them are just kind of making work. Then punctuated extinction kills most of them, like dinosaurs go out because of the meteor. And like some little mouse is like, holy crap, there's no more dinosaurs around. So that mammal ex exceptionally fast radiates into a whole bunch of species because there's empty niches. So you get punctuated extinction followed by punctuated speciation. And the final term is punctuated equilibrium. That the total number of species on the planet are roughly the same, but you're going this watch. Five are lost, punctuated extinction, followed by punctuated speciation. And so there's this equilibrium, five before, five after, punctuated change in this kind of way. followed by longer periods of genetic change. It takes punctuated speciation a long time, right? So like when we say a long time in the evolutionary time scale, it's actually kind of rapid by that scale, but it's still millions of years. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Stuff that you catch by accident when you're fishing, when you kill stuff that isn't the target species. Does it have to be this, like? Does it have to die in order to be bycatch, or can it just be? Bycatch can survive, but in the industrial fishing world, we consider that stuff that has died. So, like, when Jose goes fishing, if I catch something by accident and I can release it, that's bycatch. But technically, when we talk about fisheries globally, bycatch. I believe always means stuff that has died. Anybody else? Yes? Logistic carrying capacity? Oh, it's just the plain old carrying capacity. It's that point where population can rise and rise and rise, and eventually you're starting to peter out growth, and you get to this flat spot. The ec ecological variable for, that, the variable for that is K, which is called the carrying capacity, and logistic carrying capacity is just because of the type of growth. That's when it flattens out carrying capacity, the, the maximum sustainable population in one environment. Students, I went to see a presentation once by this old man that was really powerful. Not the old man, the presentation was <laughs> oh, so powerful, old man. <laughs> I feel it was, was it Was it Emperor Palpatine? Yes, it was. Um, about fisheries, it was at a national science teachers uh, convention down at UC San Diego, and it was in this like giant amphitheater, and there was like a thousand people in the audience, and this crusty old guy comes out on the stage, and he introduces himself, and he's like, my name is blah, 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 and I'm like a desert ecology professor or something. Whatever. He's like, I, over the years, I've been a professor for 62 years. I've studied blah, blah, blah. And I've studied blah, blah, blah. I've studied blah, blah, blah. And he says, most recently, my lab group, for the last 10 or 12 years, we've been focused on gathering status research on world fisheries. I'm here to talk to you today about world fisheries. And instead of talking, he just goes, I'd like to begin by showing you a few graphs. And do you remember when we did um, the happy fishing thing, and I said, get used to seeing this shape. It's the punchline of all environmental science. Remember that? That one, the collapse, which goes like this. Remember that shape? 
So the guy gets up there and he's standing on the stage, no notes, by the way. I'm sure he had no notes. And he's standing in front of this like giant screen. Like it's the biggest, it's like a theater, like a movie theater, but like big old projection screen. And he's got a little clicker, you can see he has something in his hand. And he goes, click. I'll be using images like this one. For example, this is the status of the world's tuna fisheries. And he's not looking at the board, he's looking at the audience kind of like blankly, like not really looking at anybody, just sort of like <laughs> lecturing without like watching people. He wasn't making eye contact, I'm sure. But. And when he talks, he goes, this is the status of the world's tuna fisheries. And the screen had nine graphs. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And he says, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Equatorial Atlantic, Indian Ocean, Arctic Ocean, North Pacific, South Pacific, Indo-Pacific, and Global Average. And all of them are like, fixed, and they're all just like, some of them are crashing like slowly, some are crashing quickly, some are like crashing with a little bump and then crashing. And then he just did this for like an hour. He's like, Atlantic Black Cod, and he like names all the fisheries. You guys know what, what a fishery means? It's one type of seafood harvested in one area. So you just have California halibut, or Alaska halibut, or Washington halibut. It's your North America halibut, if you want. So he starts to go like, cod, haddock, red snapper. And he just starts to go through them. And I don't know how he did it. But he wouldn't look at the screen. He would like just kind of like look around. He wouldn't make eye contact with people. And he just keeps going. And it was literally like pretty darn close. It probably wasn't an hour, but it felt like an hour. Like he went through like a hundred slides. And he'd be like, Atlantic, Pacific, Mediterranean, blah, 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 blah. Oh no. Uh, Atlantic, Pacific, Hawaii, only California, only Australia. He just knew them all. He could have been making it up, I couldn't really see all the words. But he just like kept going. And at the end, he's like, as you can see, we need to do a better job of teaching science. And he just gets off the stage, and everybody goes, ah! And it was like, holy, well, I think I may have, I may have added that, right? <laughs> like, the, the punchline was very simply, like, we're running out of food. Thank you. And he just like leaves, and it was the most like yeah. powerful presentation I've ever seen. I found that guy afterward, and I talked to him because his his desert research is stuff that I kind of knew a little bit about the root communication in cactus. So I'm like, oh man, I used to eat lunch with John Childers, and he told me that was so cool. To you. He said, yeah, I know that guy. So anyway, that 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 presentation has really affected the way I think about the environment and I think about teaching and the way I think about fishing in particular. <laughs> um, I, I actually found it to be really powerful. Um, then later on I found some other pictures that I've put together for this quick little slideshow. Um, if you classify all monitored fisheries of the earth as of the year, I think this is 2010, this is outdated. It might have been 2005, 2005. Well, I know it's outdated. Uh, if you classify all fisheries, red means they are overfished. Either we're taking them out faster than they breed, or we are uh, we have already collapsed it entirely, or we've abandoned that fishery. It's no longer a fishery, and that's what we mean by recovery, like the ones left in the wild are breeding without any impact because we're not fishing them anymore. That's the red. And yellow, that's like the 10 M&Ms in the happy fishing thing, where we are taking the most we can possibly take out of that fishery. Green are the ones where we might be able to get more tons of fish per year. 23% of the world's fisheries might have more food to give us. 52% um, are maxed out. And the remaining 25% are um, in some measure of collapse. But the funny thing is, you and I don't know it, because all over the world we keep getting more seafood. Every year the amount of seafood caught by tons goes up. There was one year you can see. 
in 1997 or something, where that global fishery yield dropped a little bit. But you can tell, right? Like, mom and dad, what do you mean we're running out of money? I have a bigger allowance every year. Do you all understand how both of those things are not mutually exclusive? They can both be true? You can be running out because you're using more and more every year, right? Does that make sense? <clears throat> um, as a separate conversation, you'll notice that aquaculture is replacing wild capture. The dark blue is the seafood we grow, and the light blue is the seafood we catch for the, the world on the left, China in the middle, and the world excluding China on the right. As you know, China's rising economic power means that each person is eating much more seafood than they used to, because they're eating much more protein than they used to. So per capita, China's seafood supply has grown very, very quickly. Um, as a matter of fact, I find this interesting. If you include China in a world assessment, it looks like our seafood supply is growing every year. But actually, once you cut China out of the picture, the rest of the world is eating slightly less and less seafood per year. Free China. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love China. Uh, I have to be the only one. Okay. <clears throat> um, notice that most seafood comes from our ocean, the Pacific. I find it kind of remarkable that our ocean produces twice as much as any of the other oceans or more. Yeah. What happened in 97? There's always like. I don't know. I'm curious about that too. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that was. That dude could have told you, but I, I'm not that good. Uh, and to answer that question, how is it that we're getting more and more while the ocean is running out? Things have changed. Remember, there was a time when people went fishing by taking their tackle to the shore, and you cast out, and you reel in, and like, hey, I got a little surf perch, and that's how you eat, right? And then we figured out boats. So we could like row away from shore a little bit, but it's kind of sketchy out in the water, so we gotta get back to shore. You know what I'm saying? Nowadays, fishing is a totally different situation. Here's how we have managed to get more seafood every year while the oceans are drying up. We are fishing the last places left to fish. I need to explain what you're looking at. I find it to be a really interesting um, figure. The light blue is historical fishing. The dark blue is recent fishing. What about that kind of dark? Then in between, bro. <laughs> so what you might notice here is there has been a shift from coastal and polar waters to deeper and tropical waters. Most of our recent fishing is in the hardest and last fishable areas. Nowadays, we can fish 10,000 feet down, no problem, and we are. The majority of our global modern seafood supply comes from those dark blue patches. Historically not fishable. The places we used to fish, polar and coastal, those got no more fish for you. In the dark red at the bottom, you see the areas with the most collapsed fisheries, like the heaviest impact. So the Chilean coast the West African coast, the Mediterranean, and that gap between Europe and Scandinavia, those are more than 50% overexploited. Very little left. The least impacted is the lightest color. That would probably be like the Caribbean, maybe the Atlantic, maybe Brazil. Yeah, girls? Um, wait, so majority of the fish supply comes from the deeper waters? Yeah, that's right, and tropical. Tropical and deeper, yes. You would think so because you're thinking of tropical reefs, which have a lot of productivity, but what happens with temperature and oxygen content? 
Warmer water holds less oxygen, and thus it's less productive. Less nutrients. That's right. That's right. So we're basically taking the fish from the areas where there are the least fish per square foot of water. And that thing that happens where you used to be able to fish from shore, that doesn't happen anymore. Remember how that global food supply works? Where you and I can afford to buy up the stuff that other people can't compete with us in our buying power? Banana republics? A perfect example, Nigeria sold all of its oceanic fishing rights to a company in Denmark. Yeah, so like Nigerians, they're like, uh from shore, trying to like hook a fish, and meanwhile there's like giant Danish boats out in the water like <laughs> sucking out all the fish. And so this is one of those ways that our purchasing power is causing starvation. Societies that have historically lived on sus What's it called? Sustenance fishing? Is that the right word? Subsistence fishing? Subsistence fishing? Uh, you can't really be a subsistent fisherman when you've got your rod and reel on shore and there's a whole fleet of high-tech fishing vessels offshore. So we're eating all their seafood. And most of you, when you think about fishing, you probably think of some kind of low-tech stuff, like this handsome devil, who probably catches the stuff with a couple of basic nets or rods and reels or by hand in shallow water. Notice how diverse his catch is. If you know anything about the ocean, he had to grab those clams by hand. He had to grab those invertebrates by net. And he had to grab those fish on the left of your screen, uh, probably by rod and reel. This guy is doing low-tech high labor, small yield. But now, fishing is a totally different activity. This guy probably is leasing that boat. He probably works for a company that um, supplies most of his labor and most of his financing. And he's a computer and machine operator. He probably never gets his boots wet. He's probably barefoot, actually. Or he could be. Um, because fishing has become a highly automated, large-scale thing. For number 29, you have to know three methods. Number one, trawling. <coughs> number one, trawling. <coughs> which is like this, where you drag a big old pipe that's pulling a big old net, and that big old pipe shakes up and rattles and scrapes the seafloor, and that kicks up all the life, and then the net swoops up all that life that got kicked up. This is how we get most of our shrimp, and it's very successful for catching shrimp, except you also catch a lot of other stuff on the sea bottom that ain't shrimp. Uh, when people like me, we go diving, we see a lot of other stuff that ain't food. Everywhere you go, it's like, can't eat that, can't eat that, can't eat that, can't Oh, there's food, and you chase it, and you're excited. But when you trawl, you catch all of it. This is somewhere between 80 and 90% bycatch. Making this probably the sloppiest way to get food on the planet. By the time you've picked out all the shrimp, most of that other stuff, um, not really viable when it goes back into the water. You know, the fisherman I, probably doesn't waste every single ounce of that. You, you can probably feed your cat, and you could probably feed your household with a couple of those fish. But in order, I mean, imagine if it's 80 to 90% bycatch, and I want to catch, like, a crate of shrimp, that's like a room full of dead fish. Yeah, I can eat a couple of those, but most of that's just garbage. <coughs> Number two is drift netting, which has very high bycatch, kind of. <coughs> the concept is this, look. You drop a net off the boat, then you motor around the school of fish, <coughs> leaving net behind you. Sorry about this cough, I know it's annoying. <coughs> I bring my boat all the way around the school of fish, Grab the other end of the net, 
and start pulling it in. Right? Everybody got this? Drift netting. So you can either trap them. Usually the nets have like a little scoop at the end. You can use drifting nets that catch fish. So if I see you all moving that way, I'll try to get ahead of you and then drop like a, you know, like a tennis net so that you all just hit the net. Most of these nets are really fine. It's like floss. So they snag fish on their spines or the spines on their operculum or the spines on their fins. And remember, the scale of fishing is not what you remember. So when I say a net, I mean like a 15 mile net. And I think you probably understand that 15 mile net is also like a giant parachute. If the weather changes and the storm's looking bad, and my net got tangled up on a floating container or something, and I gotta go, what am I gonna do with that net? Leave it? So first of all, it's hard to see everything in the water. You might catch some stuff you didn't mean to catch. Like in that school of fish, all right, you got a beautiful school of bonita or something, or yellowfin. That's rad. But in that school, there could be all kinds of miscellany. Oh, crap. Okay, bye. We'll come back to this.